Do you know what time it is? It's supernatural story time. And if you're easily scared, and even if you're not, there's only one thing left to do. Just turn off the lights, because these are stories that you listen to only in the dark. Dead Eyes and Other Eerie Encounters, Volume 2, Story Number 1. My son and I were coon hunting in the Fort Gay area of Wayne County. On this night, we had a pretty good young 14-month-old redbone hound with us. He had treed two nice coons, and we were getting ready to leave for home. We called for the dog, and he was coming in. When he was about 30 or 40 yards out, he opened on another track. But when he made the strike, it was not right. My son said that bark did not sound right, and I agreed. Bill, the dog's name, was not known as a dog to run anything but coon. So I was not too concerned about the bark not sounding right. Bill took off running after that thing. The chase lasted two, maybe three minutes. When he sounded his location bark and started his chop bark, we started for what we thought was the tree. He ran that track maybe 200 or so yards. All of a sudden, he changed his bark, and now he seemed to be barking into a hole. When we got to him, we found him in a country graveyard, and he was digging on a grave and eating the dirt from it. Well, we got him, put the lead on him, and walked him back to the truck. Before this night, I had always heard this land we were on was haunted, but I never felt it was until that night. Now, the name on that grave, I will not tell because this story is true, but I will tell you that I knew the man before he died. Story number two. If you've ever been to the Hilltop House Hotel in Harper's Ferry, you probably thought it was haunted. If you ever worked at the Hilltop House, you knew it was haunted. There were stories from employees and guests. We even had strange things show up on the surveillance video. I worked on the desk as the night auditor several years ago and then the desk manager more recently. So I had the opportunity to work the 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. shifts when needed. I didn't mind. There was plenty of time to get things done. One night, I was working 11 to 7 to cover for someone. I had a lot of paperwork to do that night and thought, I'd have some peace. About 2 a.m., I heard a sound in the large dining room, like chairs being thrown across the room. I went in and looked around, and nothing was disturbed. Therefore, I went back to my work. About 45 minutes later, I heard the same sound again. Again, I looked. Again, nothing was disturbed. This time, though, I took my camera that I always took with me when I worked overnight. I took some shots and got a couple of orbs. Over the next hour, I heard what sounded like chairs scraping on the floor off and on. The floors are wood in that room, and it was set up with multiple large tables of eight. No chairs were pulled out from any tables in the room. At about 4.30 a.m., I went into the waitress pantry, which opens into the large dining room, to make coffee. I had just ground the coffee beans and turned to put the coffee on, and standing in the doorway to the pantry was a man. He was about 5 feet 9 inches tall, red wavy shoulder-length hair, red full beard mustache full face nice looking face blue gray eyes stocky but not fat gray tunic like jacket with shiny brass buttons gray pants with rough looking fabric black boots he looked at me i looked at him for several seconds and then he disappeared i can still see his face as plain as day and would know if i were ever to see it again story number three Around 1947, my father and mother built a two-story frame house in the hollow of Grant County, known as Eamon Hollow. Back then, there was no electric running to the house until several years later. Kerosene lamps, candles, and flashlights were the source of light after darkness fell. I remember my dad telling me about this when I was young, and later before his death in 1989, and his story stayed the same. One fall night, Dad woke up and couldn't sleep. Instead of waking my mother, he got up and went into the living room, where he sat down at the table to smoke a cigarette. As he was smoking, he saw the dark figure of a man walk by the living room window. Being a moonlit night, Dad thought it might be one of his brother-in-laws, who had the reputation of having just a few too many pulls from a whiskey bottle, and who sometimes, when he was walking home in his unsteady condition, would stop at Mom and Dad's and sleep it off until the next morning. But he would always holler, Glenn, it's Homer! and he wouldn't come in to the house until got up and let him in. Back then, due to the low crime rate, and everyone knew everyone for miles around, no one ever locked their doors at night. 
Dad said he got up and walked into the kitchen. He had a metal five-cell flashlight, and from the moonlight shining through the kitchen window into the kitchen door, he was sure what he saw later. Dad was waiting for Homer to announce his presence, but no one called out his name. Dad said from the moonlight he could see the doorknob, and he saw the doorknob start turning. It turned about halfway, but not enough to open the door. Dad then got behind the kitchen door, using the flashlight as a possible weapon. Dad knew it wasn't Homer. The doorknob then returned to its former position, as if someone had started to open the door and then let go of it. When this happened, Dad, using the flashlight as a club, opened the kitchen door. No one was there. He then checked all around the house. No one was there. Dad told me that he was sure what he saw of the figure and the turning of the doorknob. About a week later, my grandfather lived about two hollows over, known as Hinkle Hollow, or Our Roads, because he lived at the upper end of the hollow. Granddad walked out on the porch of his house, took a brush of snuff, and turned around to go back into his house. As he grasped the doorknob, he had a massive heart attack and died instantly. The snuff dried stiff in his mouth. Dad always believed it was a token, as other people call stage signs or happenings, of his father's death. His seeing the figure and the turning of the doorknob, just like when my grandfather died. Next story. I have lived in the country since I was a young, young boy. When I came of age to go out on my own, I brought some property I had my eye on since I was five or six. I worked for an electric company and decided to buy more property. And as I extended, I used property to house goats, cows, chickens, and some beagles I used for hunting coon. Many occasions, I would have odd feelings of panic and fear while I was among the wooded areas of my property, putting up tree stands or throwing feed out to attract deer. When those feelings would arise, I would leave. One night, I was getting ready for coon hunting. I went to get the dogs, and they were going crazy, howling and barking, before we even went into the wooded area to hunt. We got in the wooded area about two miles from my farmhouse, when I started to feel uneasy. The dogs were whimpering at this point, and I couldn't figure out why. When we came up on one of my tree stands, I saw someone sitting in it, then glanced again and saw nothing. I kept moving until I walked into a clearing where I saw a fire burning. Well, this couldn't be because my property was private property. I looked around but saw no personal effects. I walked back to the tree stand to look one more time when I heard many footsteps crackling in the wooded area. I drew up my rifle and headed back toward the fire. When I made it back, the fire was gone and no trace of it. So I packed it in for the night. The next morning, I went out to look for the spot but saw nothing including where the fire was at. I went to the tree stand and found a doll made out of brush and twigs. I had found these on my property up until I became ill in 1997. I never saw anything or anybody, but I always heard local lore about witches on the property prior to me owning it. I must say I believe it. I had many animals die in my time there. My family currently farms the property and reports the same things back to me. Next story. This story was told to me one night. I didn't believe it until I saw it. The town of Rawlsburg was created during the Civil War. It was a great valley along the river that was created by the railroad. The mountain around it looked like a great place for the soldiers to hide. This story starts in the 1800s. I was never told the exact date. A young couple was placed in an arranged marriage. The husband couldn't be happier. A young bride who was very beautiful, a great job, and anything a man could want. The wife, though, was very unhappy. She didn't love this man. The man she loved was a blacksmith, but the blacksmith and her dad didn't get along, so they had been forbidden to marry. The night before the wedding, the young woman and man were heading into the town where they were going to be married. Dad caught a late-night train, and as the train went through, the woman just kept looking out the window, not talking or anything. The man asked what was wrong, and she told him. This ensued an argument where the man hit the woman. The woman ran out of the car. They were in and into the place between the two cars. The woman then jumped and landed on the ground right before the man caught her arm. She made it and ran, ran to a house that was next to the train tracks. Pounding on the door, she found no one was there, but found the door unlocked. She ran inside and ran up the stairs trying to hide. When she thought she found the spot, she just stayed there, calmed down. 
She heard nothing. She stood up and walked out into the hall. Then she heard footsteps. They came closer and then silence. She just stood there, being able to see nothing in the dark. She decided to find a light switch as she felt around the wall, and then she found it. When she turned it on, there was her fiancé with his head cut off. He was carrying an iron pan from the kitchen. Then it came down on her head with a heavy thud. The next morning, the two bodies were found. She was found in the house. Her head was smashed with a heavy object. Her fiancé was found by the train tracks. It looked like he had jumped from the train and got stuck under the rails. Now, every foggy night, around the anniversary of their deaths, you can hear a train that comes down the tracks. As a train comes to the bend where they jumped, you can see the ghostly figure of a young woman jumping off the ghost train followed by a man. The woman stands up and runs across the street and into the house. You never see the figure of the man stand back up. If you stand there long enough, some say you can hear the agonizing cry of the man as he's carried under the train. The next part is in the house. The young woman's spirit has seemed to never die. She still roams the halls of the old house. Her favorite spot is the room where she had hid. They say she stays in that room, just sitting on the bed crying. I never believed it until I spent the night there. The young girls that I was staying with had gotten the key to the room. They kept the room locked, and I never figured out why. We were playing truth or dare when I took a dare. I had to go into the room and stay in there for five minutes. I took it and went in. The room had been dressed all in red. I went over to the bed and sat down. Then I heard it, the crying. It grew louder and louder, until I knew someone was behind me. I turned around and saw her. She was staring at me. The ghostly female then screamed at me, Look what he did to my face. I just want to go home. Then she was gone. Scared to death, I ran to the door trying to get out. The girls then let me out and laughed at me, except for one whom saw it one time before. I explained what I had seen, and she backed my story. I have never been back in that room, and plan never to go back. Next story. In the summer of 1986, my family moved into a parsonage in Logan, where my father was to become the new minister of a church there. The previous minister, a Reverend Rush, had passed away. As a tall man, he was unable to go upstairs to use the bathroom in his last day, so another bathroom was installed next to the dining room on the first floor. The water heater was on the other side of the wall. All four bedrooms were upstairs, and the living and dining rooms and kitchen were downstairs. I was in college in Oklahoma at the time, but I visited my family during the holidays. The first experience with the paranormal occurred one afternoon when I was away at school. My mother had gone upstairs to take a nap while the rest of the family remained downstairs in the living room to watch TV. Several minutes later, my mother came downstairs and said, Who keeps opening my door and looking in at me? No one knew who she was talking about. The only description my mother gave of the intruder was that it was a tall man. But no one had been upstairs. My sister also had an encounter with something inexplicable. Night after night, she complained to my father that someone was walking around in the overhead attic. My father, a non-believer, when it came to the supernatural, dismissed my sister's claim by explaining that she was probably hearing squirrels. My sister said, Since when do squirrels walk on two feet? Still, no investigation was made. Finally, one night my sister had enough. The walking was keeping her up, so she shouted for it to stop. It did. During the summer of 1992, I taught an English composition class at the local community college. My father's office was downstairs in the basement. One day, I was down there by myself grading papers. My sister and my father had gone car shopping together. No one else was home. While I was reading a student's essay, I heard someone come through the back door on the first floor. Then I heard these heavy footsteps walking right over my head, which was where the dining room was located. Thinking my sister and my father had come back from car shopping, I went upstairs to ask them if they'd found a car, but there was no one on the first floor. I called up the stairs, but got no response. Then I looked through the kitchen window, which looked out on the carport. No car. That's when I felt the hair on the back of my neck stand up. Apparently, I'd heard the heavy tread of the late Reverend Rush. Things seemed to come to a head in October of that same year. I was away in California at the time. What happened can either be explained as normal or as paranormal, but it almost cost my family their lives. 
Apparently, something went wrong with the water heater. It overheated and exploded, taking about a third of the house with it. Luckily, my family was unharmed, but their lives were forever changed. The parsonage went through extensive repairs, and although my family moved back into it, things were never the same. Why, after having been there for six years, did the water heater suddenly explode? Just the day before the explosion occurred, a parishioner from the church had inspected the water heater and told my father that everything was all right. I mean, we're talking about the same water heater on the other side of the wall of the bathroom that had been built for Reverend Rush. Coincidence? Even today, I don't know. My parents have since moved into another house outside of Logan. Since they moved, I haven't been by the old parsonage, and perhaps it's for the best. I hope that whoever moves into that house won't encounter the same kind of phenomena my family and I did. But until someone else does move in, I'm curious to know if there's already somebody inside waiting. Next story. Every year, the city park in Martinsburg, West Virginia, fills to overflowing for its annual display of 4th of July fireworks. Today, the park is a wonderful green space with pavilions, picnic tables, miniature golf, and a swimming pool. During the Civil War, it was a large open space with a major freshwater source. Close to the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad, the space was used as a camp by soldiers in gray and blue throughout the war. During those frequent times when the armies fought for control of the town, men died violently in the park. A few years ago, one extended family arrived at the park several hours before the fireworks were to begin. They wanted just the right spot to spread their blankets and enjoy the goodies in their picnic basket. Altogether, there were 12 of them, five adults and seven children. After dinner, the children left the picnic site to roam through the gathering crowd while the adults laced on the blankets and ignited a couple of firecrackers of their own. The grandfather was the first to notice the smell. He turned his head in the direction of the offending odor and saw a teenage boy leaning on a nearby tree. The teenager didn't seem to notice the family, but the family certainly noticed him and the pungent odor that seemed to be wafting off of him. They described the odor in various ways, old sweat, horse flop, rotting garbage, or the smell of rancid meat. All agreed it was such an awful smell they weren't going to put up with it a minute longer. The father yelled at the boy saying, Get out of here, boy. You're stinking up the place. The teenage boy continued to lean against a tree, ignoring what he must have heard. Outraged, the mother said, That's it. I'm going to get a cop. And off she charged with a full head of steam. In a few minutes, she returned with a uniformed policeman. He's right over there, she said as she pointed dramatically to the tree where she had last seen the smelly teenage boy. He was gone, and her normally loud and rowdy family was utterly silent. We were all watching that kid, said the grandfather to no one in particular. He just disappeared in front of our eyes. The older man turned to the police officer and said, I know you won't believe us, but I'm pretty sure we just saw a ghost. That night, the police at the park received two other complaints about a foul-smelling teenager boy. He was never found. The next day, I met with one of the officers who had been at the park and responded to one of the complaints. Everyone who smelled and saw that boy described him about the same way. Five foot tall, torn brown pants, filthy red checkered shirt, suspenders, no shoes, filthy feet, and a weird flat top cap with a small brim on the front. Do you think he could have been a Confederate soldier? Yes, indeed, officer. Confederate soldiers were often ragged. Soap was unavailable. Caps with weird flat tops and small brims were worn by Confederate soldiers. They were called kepis. Next story. My aunt lived near a graveyard, and when the men would dig the graves, she always sent them up some Kool-Aid to drink and some sandwiches to eat. On one particular day, there was a lady buried, and she had some beautiful flowers and ribbons. My dad was out of town, so we decided to spend the weekend with my aunt and make homemade fudge. My aunt and mother were talking about what a beautiful ribbon rug they would make when the caretaker got rid of the flowers. Well, the more they talked about it, the more anxious they became and decided after dark they would go up to the grave. While they were up there helping themselves to the ribbons, a car drove by and they had to hide in the shadows of the grave. My mother accidentally rolled over on the grave and had a chill come over her and became afraid. So they left without getting all the ribbons they originally wanted. Later that evening, we were making fudge and All of us kids were helping my mom and aunt roll up the ribbons. All of a sudden, my aunt screamed, Oh my God! 
Look in the window. Talking about kids scattering, we ran and hid under the beds, and in the midst of us scurrying about, my mom's chair fell backwards, and she hit her head. Well, of course, my aunt was teasing, so she set us all down and went to bed. Later that night, we awoke to the sound of scratching on the bathroom screen, and we thought someone was trying to break in. My mom and aunt were afraid to get up. My mom decided she would go see what was making the noise. My aunt screamed, and someone or something jumped on my back while I was in bed. I started screaming, and soon all the kids were screaming and crying. Finally, my aunt turned the lights on and checked my bedroom, the doors, and the windows. Everything looked normal. So after a fashion, we all went back to bed. During the night, a light snow fell, and when my cousin opened the kitchen door to check out the snow, a pool of fresh blood was outside the door. Well, my aunt decided it must have been from a hurt animal and thought no more about it. That evening, she went to fetch the cigar box that held the rolled-up ribbons, and to her surprise, the box was nowhere to be found. To this day, we don't know where the ribbons went or what caused the pool of blood. I've often wondered if it wasn't the lady who took back what rightfully belonged to her. Next story. My grandmother told this story to me. According to her, when she was a child, an old woman lived next door to her and her family in the small coal town of Nolan. My grandmother stated that many strange things happened in and around the old woman's home. On one occasion, my grandmother, who was scared to death of old Aunt Kate, witnessed the old woman stick her hand back into a coal-burning stove and pull out hot coals and wiggle them in her hand without being burned. Grandmother also stated that Aunt Kate would openly admit to witchcraft and on one occasion claimed to have fought with the devil himself, ripping his leg off and throwing it behind a bed. The most disturbing story about Aunt Kate pertained to the old woman not getting something that she wanted. My great-grandfather had produced a garden several miles from his home every year. This particular year was very dry. Water had to be carried out to the crops as well as extra care needed to be taken when ensuring the crop survival. My grandmother helped her father throughout the growing season, and when Dan came to harvest the crops, my grandmother worked with him to bring the crops the long distance back to the old home place. As my grandmother and great-grandfather were wheeling the crops past Aunt Kate's, she stopped them and stated, Harrison, give me some of them beans. Now, my great-grandfather was a very generous man, but felt that due to the hard work they had put in the family, she'd get first choice in the crops, he replied. A woman, we worked hard for those beans, and you're not going to get any. Aunt Kate was very angry at this reply and stated, Okay, Harrison, you'll be sorry. And were they ever... That night, after the family went to bed, my grandmother stated that she heard something walking in the house. According to her, the thing walked into her room and stood at the head of where she was sleeping, and then it would turn and walk out of the room. My grandmother said she had never been so scared. Because of this walking, she didn't sleep all night. The next morning, my grandmother came in for breakfast and was confronted by my great-grandfather about the thing that walked the night before. My grandmother stated that she and my great-grandfather were the only two in a house of twelve to hear it walk. My grandmother stated that her father took old Aunt Kate the beans without haste, and as he gave them to her, he told her, Take your booger back. She replied in an evil tone, It won't bother you no more. And it didn't. Next story. I had walked down to the game room. It's an arcade about five minutes below my house, which is on a hill up against a mountain. <clears throat> it was about 11, 11.30 p.m., and I started walking back home, and I heard some kind of loud noise, like a woman screaming. I spotted something on the mountain standing beside the light pole on the other end of my home. When I got to the top of my hill, I froze in fear, not knowing what it was, and it just watched me. About ten minutes later, my neighbor, which has a two-story home, saw me standing there, and he knew something was wrong, because I wouldn't answer him when he hollered at me. I saw the tall, dark thing looking towards my neighbor's house. I ran behind our building outside, but I could still see it. It kept standing there. About five minutes had gone by, and my neighbor, with his gun, came running up the hill to see what was wrong. That thing had saw him and turned and ran, walked back into the mountains. I was so terrified, it had scared my dog so bad that she had under my neighbor's porch. Finally, my neighbor got on the hill where I was at, and I explained to him what I saw. It was about nine or ten feet tall, long dark fur from head to foot, 
and it walked, ran in long strides. My dad and Roger, the neighbor, told me to get in the house. They had their guns, and they saw footprints about 18 to 20 inches long or more. The weeds and limbs on the trees were torn off as if someone had taken a weed whacker to them. The next night, my neighbor was laying down in his daughter's room on the couch watching her, when all of a sudden something hit his sliding door so hard that it knocked his curtain rods and all down. He grabbed his gun, went outside, but didn't see anything. He put the curtains back up, went to see if he could hit the doors and knock the curtains down. He couldn't hit it hard enough, so he said whatever it was had to be at least nine or ten feet tall to be able to knock them down. He saw the same footprints in his yard the next morning. It seemed that Bigfoot was on the prowl. Next story. It all really started in the summer of 2001 for our family. There was an earlier account in the late 70s, but that's a whole nother story. Our family moved to this farm in 1991. For 10 years, we would hear things in the woods behind our home. The kids were little then and weren't allowed out of the yard. I didn't worry too much about what was out there. We would go for hikes on the hill up until 1997. Then, in the fall of 97, while I was hiking up on the ridge line with the kids, we heard a very loud growl that echoed through the hilltops, and it came from right behind us, over a small dip in the hill. We left immediately and never went back without my husband with us. In the summer of 2001, my kids' names and ages at that time were Sarah, 12, Rachel, 11, Katie, 9, and Jonathan, 6, were playing out back in the field. Since they were older, they were allowed to wander around some of the nearby woods, creek, and the neighbor's field. They were playing out behind our home across the field at the creek. Our dog Sam was with them. All of a sudden, a loud crashing sound was heard above them in the woods. Something was coming straight down the hillside towards them, crashing through the trees. The kids couldn't see what it was. The trees were so dense. It sounded big, very big. The kids were terrified, and Sam the dog took off after whatever it was. When Sam took out after it, it changed direction. It wasn't going straight down the hillside toward the kids anymore. It took off then around the hillside with a dog hot in its heels. The kids came running inside to tell me what happened. I was just glad whatever it was took off the other way when the dog gave chase. I was worried about the dog, of course, but knew he could take care of himself. I wasn't going looking for him, that's for sure. But two hours later, Sam finally came back. He was covered in some kind of stinky slime. He was covered head to toe with it. The slime had a horrible smell to it. Two days later, early in the morning, I had the windows open. It was sunny and cool. I was standing at a window that faces the back hill where the huge animal was heard running a few days before. Our dog Sam and Big Dog were sleeping right below the window in the yard. A few seconds later, I heard a loud bellow type of yell or scream or growl directly in front of me on the hillside. The dogs heard it too. They jumped up and took off after whatever it was, barking madly. I told the kids they weren't allowed to play on the hillside or creek until we found out what it was that was up there. Like most kids, they didn't listen and took off for our hillsides. Sarah and Rachel were playing around toward the left of the hill while Katie and Jonathan had taken off around the bend to the right. Katie and John had the wild idea to scare the older girls by hiding down in the weeds, wait for the girls to walk by and jump out at them. While waiting for the older girls, Katie and John heard something coming down the hill towards them. Thinking it was Sarah and Rachel, they stayed down in their hiding place a minute or two more. Katie then jumped up, not to be met face to face with her sisters, but face to face with Bigfoot. Yes, Bigfoot. It was about ten yards away, sitting on a fallen tree. It was sitting as if a human would. Katie screamed, and John jumped up to see, and then saw it too. They said it was a very dirty grayish color. It had long hair all over. Jonathan distinctly remembered it had dingleberries hanging off its backside as they watched it take off running back up the hillside. I'm not sure who was more scared, my kids or the Bigfoot. Katie and Jonathan then ran down the hillside screaming, with Sarah and Rachel following. They were scared to death. I had them both draw me a picture of what they saw. I separated them in different rooms so they wouldn't copy. I wanted to make sure they weren't telling stories. They drew identical pictures. I knew they were telling the truth just by Jonathan's reaction to what he saw. He had nightmares for weeks and will not to this day go into the woods without an adult with him. And he's 11 years old now. A couple of days later, the older girls went back up the hill to check 
and see if there's any evidence of Bigfoot. After a few minutes, something up on the hill above them was throwing huge rocks down on them. I'm not talking little pebbles and such. I'm talking big rocks. As big as your head came sailing through the air at them from the hillside. They ran home and fast. About a month later, the end of July, I was taking a hike in the hills with my kids. My mom and dad and my brother, safety in numbers I've always heard, we were following a dirt road that runs across the ridge line. On the left of us, the property line is divided with a barbed wire fence. On the right, it slopes downhill into a cleared off hillside. Then about 50 feet below, multi-flora rose bushes have grown up. Then the woods begin. I'm walking about 100 feet ahead of the rest of the family along with Sarah. Our dog, Puff, was walking at my side. We heard some rustling in the thorn bushes below us. At first, I'm thinking cows. We have a few head of cattle on the farm roaming. In addition, we are walking in their pasture area. Anyway, Puff also heard it and perked up looking over the hillside towards the right. Puff starts barking and takes off down the hill. I know then it is not a cow. Puff doesn't chase cows. Sarah and I then see a head, a hairy head and shoulders standing above the multi-flora rose bushes. It takes off down the hillside towards the trees with Puff on its heels. Whatever this thing was, it was taller than the bushes, which we later went down and judged to be at least eight or nine feet tall, and this thing stood a head taller than the bushes. It was a reddish-brown color, not the gray the kids saw, therefore we have more than one around here. I've told several family members and friends of what we've seen. They think we're crazy. I know there is something out there. I was like most people. I didn't believe in such things until I saw it with my own eyes.